I'm so pleased that we're able to offer this to you today. This is something unusual, something that's not taking place in any other Southern California high school. But we have two people here. Mr. Frank Murray's over in the other classroom right now talking about cybersecurity. You will get those lessons as well. And then we have Mr. Frank Sarkisa here today who's going to talk to you about artificial intelligence. I want to tell you a little bit about Mr. Sarkisa before we begin. He is known globally, around the world, as the artificial intelligence expert for the United States. He has spoken in front of the United Nations General Assembly talking about artificial intelligence. If you ever get him sidelined off to talk about some fun things, he'll tell you about what's happening all over the world in little hot pockets with artificial intelligence. He is helping us develop our artificial intelligence cybersecurity program that he says will begin next year. So to have him here at Fairmont Preparatory Academy is like, I mean, it gets me a little excited because I, I can't actually believe that someone who speaks in front of the general session of the United Nations is now going to speak in front of you. So I want you to show him how good you are. I want you to give him your complete attention. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Leo Sergeant. Industries, technologies, solutions. 
You guys have a huge advantage over the old guys like me, where we're so set in our ways and it's hard for us to think differently. You guys are coming with a fresh set of eyes. And so, you know, the industries of tomorrow, the future of work, all these things, you can actually shape all that right now. Is that pretty cool? No? Too much work? <laughs> I was over to have a robot butler and I just watched, I guess, Game of Thrones when you're old enough. <laughs> First, I do want to address the fear factor. A lot of people are concerned about what is this going to mean? Are machines going to take over the world, eradicate humanity? No. Are robots going to come up and take your jobs? Maybe. Some jobs will go away, and some jobs will get created. At the end of the day, you have to remember that AI, like all technology, is just a tool. You can use it for good, you can use it for bad, you can use it to create. He's destroyed. But if you choose to hide, then you're only going to be along for the ride. You'll let other people dictate how you're going to live your life and what you can do, or you're going to be the driver. By understanding what AI can do, and think about what you can do either for yourself, your family, your community, for your future employer, whoever it might be. And if you don't really believe me and say, hey, no, those are the old footy daddies like my parents, my grandparents that don't get this stuff. Does anybody recognize this invention? Printing press. Printing press, right? When the printing press was first produced, people thought it was the end of the world. They said this has to be stopped because it's going to corrupt knowledge, right? It's going to pervert truth. People don't know how to use it. It's going to be the end of civilization as we know it. Did that happen? No. no. Does it sound silly what they were saying? Like it's going to corrupt our knowledge? And it might spread to the masses? Right? I bet people 50 years from now will be saying the same thing about us as we worry about AI and these technologies. Not to say again, not that bad things couldn't happen, but we have a chance to shape it and a chance to create the right mindset. Right? We have a real chance to forge a partnership here. I don't believe in the Terminator future, as they say. I believe in the cyborg future, that we're moving towards human machine integration, that we're going to enhance our own capabilities with machines because we're actually trying to make ourselves better as people. I'll talk more about that in a second, but I kind of want to answer the eternal question. Could a machine create? Could it imagine? Could it create art? Well, I'm going to show you a video about an AI named Benjamin that wrote a film for The ability to add daylight. All right, you can't tell me that. Yeah, I'm telling you that thing. I don't want to be honest with you. You don't have to be a doctor. I'm not sure. I don't know what you're talking about. Lord of I just wanted to tell you that I was much better. Anything that can be commoditized. 
And when it comes to films, there's only 12 archetypes. Every movie you've ever seen fits into one of those 12 archetypes. So you can teach the machine 12 archetypes, teach about characters, teach about dialogue, and voila. Now it's a little nonsensical, even though it won some film awards, but the AI is going to keep getting better as it does more and more film scripts. In fact, you have AI that's doing sculpting, you have another AI that's actually painting. Its first painting sold at Christie's for $435,000. How about that? You know, which I am in the So the question becomes then, so I'm going to some powerful tools here, some capabilities. But what is AI, right? He said Siri is not AI, Alexa is not AI. AI is actually a machine that can mimic human thinking. You can actually do like low-level admin tasks that require some level of cognition, but without a human supervision. And so when it comes to AI, we're really looking for three things. The first is this concept of machine learning. You don't actually program an AI, it actually learns on its own. You give it lots and lots of data. And then you give it something that we call ground truth rules on how to make decisions. How many of you have parents that give you rules on how to make decisions? I don't know what the other parents are doing. <laughs> right? They're just telling you decisions, but it's much like teaching a child. We have an AI doing something new, with a three-year-old kid. You have lots of information, you let them try things, you have teachers that correct it along the way, but it goes from three-year-old to PhD in just a few weeks. Right? There's no coding involved. How many of you guys have ever played the game Go? Only a couple. It's the most complicated game that humans have ever developed. Right? We can't, it's not like chess. In chess, there's a finite number of moves. In Go, for every move, there's 100,000 next moves, and there's 100,000 moves after that and that. So you can't just brute force calculate your way through. It's a game that's more about intuition and instinct and feel than anything else. So the guys at DeepMind said, can we build a machine that can play this game? You know how they taught it? Gave it a rule book. Said, this is how you play go. So these are the rules when you make decisions. Then they said, AlphaGo, here's 10,000 hours of television footage of people playing the game. Didn't say if they're good. Good players, bad players, good strategy, bad. Watch, learn. And after I did that, he said, okay, we want you to play yourself one million times. And so they did that in the span of one week. And then that's how it mastered the game. And then it entered the Go Championship. And to everyone's surprise, it won. It beat was considered one of the greatest Go champions of all time. Definitely, I think it's a top 10, maybe top 15 of all time in human history. Impressive. So, to outdo themselves, they built another machine called AlphaGo Zero. AlphaGo Zero was able to beat AlphaGo after I think just a couple of weeks of training. Then they told AlphaGo, learn chess. So they gave AlphaGo Zero the rules for chess and nothing else. It said become the grandmaster of machine league. That's right, there's a grandmaster of machines out there. It learned the rules and practiced. It went into the machine league and became the grand champion. Do you know how long they took AlphaGo Zero to do that? Four hours. I, I wish I could do that. I wish I could do my homework in four hours, right? That's how fast machines learn. That is a huge, huge capability that they have. Second, they have the ability to understand natural language. Think about how you talk. Is that really English? How many years you slang? <coughs> Jargon, idiom, cliches, grunts. Right. What is the machine going to make of all that? If I say I'm feeling blue and the brain catches dogs, what does the machine think? 
<laughs> Physically, the color of blue because small animals are raining from the sky. It doesn't make any sense. I was confused. With AI, it doesn't look at literal meaning. It doesn't look at key words. It's trying to understand context for the conversation. And you know, when you say, hey, that's bad, you don't mean that. Right? It's really hard for a machine to do, but your Alexa, your Siri, can it do that? That's why it's not really AI. Third, it has the ability to interact with you as to another person. For better or worse, Google has taught us to use keywords. If you want to buy a bicycle, what do you do? It's like buy a bicycle, right? You know, Brazilian web pages, there are a few more keywords, you try those, maybe you look at some Facebook pages, Instagram Live, all that kind of stuff, and try to make a decision. Whereas in the AI, you can go to the AI, you go like, yo, I want to buy a bike. What do you think the AI's going to tell me? Here's the best way to buy one. It's probably going to ask me, why do I want one, right? Why do, why do you want one? Ah, I want to get back to you. How often do you think you'll write it? Ah, four, five times a week, maybe an hour at a time. Where do you think you'll ride the bike at? Ah, wherever you want it. Great, here's my bike for you. So it's like having the best friend that happens to know about bicycles that obviously saves you a lot of time to figure out what you want. But I use best friend with good reason because it's not just looking at information is asking me about all oh, its problems about bikes, it knows things about me, right? It knows that, yeah, he says four or five times a week, but he's super busy, he's doing it once a week. I know he doesn't like to spend a lot of money on stuff, and so it's doing all these things that knows me, my personality, to come up with the best individual recommendation. It's these three things together that really make up artificial intelligence. Not only this, how many things out there do you think are AI or really AI? I see one person saying zero, right? That doesn't mean there's no AI out there, <clears throat> there's actually quite a bit, right? And we, sometimes we don't really see it all. But I can tell you that today there's not a sector or industry that's not using artificial intelligence. It's in healthcare, it's in education, it's in sports, it's in legal services. To media, right? How many people have been to the what's the Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland? Amazing, right? Do you know how much of that is actually powered by AI? A lot. The rides are all powered by AI. The line optimization is powered by AI. If you do the building droids, the whole supply chain, the parts, everything, AI. You know your droid has a personality created by AI. You talk to the animatronics, it's not just a loop conversation. It's actually the AI. Actually, we're, I recognize you, I remember you. You know on the Bolivian Falcon ride? Really yeah. Yeah? Right? That guy, Han, Han, what was his name, Han Solo? Not Han Solo, it was on the. the uh, no, not Lando. There's a new character, he's in the next movie. But he's the guy that uh, recruits you to do this run. You, get, you actually get paid if you. Don't destroy the ship. But he'll actually, that character will actually recognize you. It's a robot that will actually recognize you if you've done this before. And if you do destroy the ship, they'll put a bounty on you. And they will recognize throughout the little park area that you have a bounty on you. Right? But that's Disney using AI across the board now in theme parks. So there's a lot of AI everywhere. But what can we actually do with it other than have fun, entertain it? Well, this, I'm going to show you a little video. You have to watch carefully. There's no audio here, but watch what this guy is doing and what happens with this robotic arm. Okay. How did he do that? Huh? Logical? Is he wearing anything? You see anything on his body? Oh. Right? He's got a little thing over here. Right? What we've learned is, even though you have a stump, I guess 
Yeah, in this case, your stump, your muscles can still try and control a hand that doesn't exist. In fact, your brain can still send signals to the stump, electrical signal, to try to do something. We learned that AI can actually figure out what these signals mean, the muscle motion, the brain signals. And if the AI can decode that, it lets you now control an artificial limb. So imagine that, if you lose a hand, an arm, a leg, you can still maintain full range of motion through an AI-powered artificial limb. <coughs> we have people that are blind, where they've actually been able to install digital cameras into their eyes and transmit the picture to the brain. Right? It's a little experimental, but the picture is black and white and fuzzy, but suddenly blind people, like people who've never been able to see in their entire lives, can now see. What? Pretty amazing? Yeah. Pretty scary? Yeah. <laughs> pretty cyborg ish? Yes. Yeah, this is why I believe in the cyborg future. Right? We're looking at how we can enhance our own capability of this technology. Right? Imagine that you can see in the dark without bodies. Can we do that? Yeah. Probably good. Some day soon. These, these are the power, these are the tools that we actually have with artificial intelligence. These are the guys pioneering all this stuff today. And we've just scratched the surface. There's so much opportunity out there. But we have a challenge. How do we figure out this opportunity? How do we do all these things? Right? You all have smart parents, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. Right? Are your parents figuring all these things out? No. Some might be, most are probably not. Most people don't know how to grasp this technology, the power at our fingertips to know what to do with it. Why do you think that is? What do you think the big challenge is? Using a new mindset? It's a new mindset, right? How many people like Apple products? Yeah. Try to pick an example of what's really there. What's Apple's slogan? Apple. Not money. <laughs> they like. Oh, man, you guys love Apple? But you don't know the slogans? <laughs> well, work harder, cost less, something like that. Work harder. Do more, cost less. You're close. Think differently. Oh. Yeah. Apple slowly just think differently. And that's our challenge. We have trouble thinking differently. We get used to what we're doing. Right? We're taught to do it a certain way. Or we go you know, into a job, or we just study for a test, and like we, we always use the same method. We don't think about how we can think differently. And that's the big challenge. People are taught how to automate. And unfortunately, when it comes to AI, automation only lasts about 20 to 30% of the value. So I'm not saying it's worthless, right? You should never look for automation. But it's not as good as innovation, where we can really unlock the full potential from AI. You might be saying, well, what's really the difference? Well, automation focuses on trying to improve an existing process or system. Basically, we want to make something faster. We want to make it cheaper. We want to make it with less errors, right? But innovation. Innovation says, you know what? We can do this better. I want to change the process or system, right? I don't want to just improve it. I want to change it and find a different way of doing it. That's where the power really is. Right? Think about our video over here. Is this automation or innovation? Innovation, innovation right? By a whole new way to control artificial weapons. Right? This is what makes great entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs. People are trying to innovate inside their own company. About thinking differently. And if you want to succeed with AI, that's what you have to do, right? You can do automation. Again, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, it's not worth, worthwhile. If you want to be a game changer, it's a lot of innovation. 
Since its prior use began in June 2017, it has served 400,000 patients. We established a joint program with Tencent to provide necessary data. Now the accuracy of early detection of esophageal cancer has reached 90%, roughly the same level of diagnosis made by human doctors. This is one of the first hospitals in China to put such an intelligent system on a pilot trial for clinical testing. Last November, China announced a plan to build a national platform for AI diagnostic medical imaging. Developers say they are trying to enlarge the system's database and expand its coverage in China. AI is able to learn from lots of data. That's what humans can't do. We hope the system can reach out to remote areas and grassroots hospitals in China, where patients can get a diagnosis as accurate as in first-class hospitals in big cities. So far, the system has been used for detection of esophageal and lung cancer, as well as diabetes. It's expected to cover the 10 deathliest cancers in China in the future. So that's it. CGTN, Shenzhen. Who, uh, who is the machine doctor? Who is the machine doctor? It's a choice between a human or a machine. Most people say human. People say machine, right? Why, uh, why, a why, 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 can uh, can humans not function? Yes. Okay. What's another another reason? For what less? Don't be shy. I wrote a bunch of the thing I heard took a shot it out. What's another reason you'd rather see a human doctor? You're more comforting. Is that really true? Machines can't give you a human connection. They probably do understand pain better than the machine. More experimental? Are you sure about that? Yeah. <laughs> I think people trust the experiences of human doctors over the training of an AI, even if the accuracy of the AI may be greater. It's just something that humans have an affinity for other humans at the moment. Okay. So a uh, human doctor has a 1 out of 7 chance of misdiagnosing you. Is that good? That's pretty bad. Uh, not that great, hey, we're human, right? A machine doctor has a 1 out of 100,000 chance of misdiagnosing you. Good? That's good? That's good. So there's, there's an area of AI called artificial empathy. Where even though machines don't feel the emotions, they can actually detect it in humans and dynamically change how they interact. So if you're you're happy and the machine's joking around with you and suddenly the course of conversation, if you're suddenly sad, it might try to cheer you up. Or if you get angry, it might try to calm you down. So actually it's been shown that machines are much better at reading the emotional state of a person than another person. Why do you think that is? Because they're programmed to know emotions, so they understand better. We're kind of on the right track there. They have a lot more data points. Yeah, they can process more data points. Innovation. Innovation, <laughs> sure. They probably analyze about the size of the human. Yeah, so one, they can read body language way better than we can, right? There's over 2,000 points on your face alone that reveal a lie. Right? The best human can watch five to seven of them in real time. The machine can see how many? All of them in real time. The other thing is machines don't get distracted. Think about that. When someone is talking to you, do you always have your full attention on them? No, right? You're we're probably thinking about your homework assignment, right? Yeah. <laughs> So machines don't get distracted, so they're actually always listening, they always pay attention. The other interesting thing is that people are more honest with machines. There's 
the amount of doctor 20 years, and lawyer 20 years, and accountant 20 years, people will actually tell the machine the truth than that human doctor of 20 years. Why do you think that is? Because uh, they believe, like, you know, the machine won't tell other people to go even the risk that they might tell other people. Well, I think deep down we know the machine's going to share that information, right? <laughs> Yeah, we know the machine is not going to check it, right? When we talk to a human, even if we know that person for a long time, we're afraid they're going to, they're going to judge us, right? It's like, oh man, I really like this girl, but I can't tell my best friend because, uh, you know. You can tell the machine, the machine's not going to care. <laughs> Not to, it's not to say that machines are better than people and everything, they're definitely not. But it's interesting that even though we know machine doctors are better than human doctors in terms of accuracy, even engaging the patient, having time for the patient, we prefer a human doctor. Now, how many of you guys have seen the Star Wars movies? And have you seen any human doctors in the No. No, right? They're all robots. And remember, this was a long, long time ago. <laughs> so it shows some of the advancements that we've made. Now, China, China's made huge investments in AI. In fact, they built an area called Future China Tech City in Hanzhou, China. They spent over 400 million US dollars for the universities, departments, transportation, all these things, bringing venture capital things. A big company with Alibaba and Tencent in. Their goal was to get a thousand AI startups in three years. They did it in 11 months. And about 10% of those startups are actually foreign entrepreneurs coming to China to start their AI business. Because the talent, the people, the money, the infrastructure, the system is all that. So, given that, who's number two? Right, Singapore. <laughs> That's right, Canada. Uh, yeah. <laughs> number four, Japan. Yeah, yeah. yes. Number five, South Korea. <laughs> we, have a, we have a bit of a problem here, right? But this, this problem is not the opportunity for these guys. This is why. So if you look at like if you look at just healthcare alone, there are opportunities across the board that we might not have. All the way from the patient side, all the way to the physician side. Typically when we talk about technology, we talk about automating blue collar jobs, like machinists, like welders. The AI, we're actually talking about now bringing capabilities to white collar jobs like doctors and lawyers. Law is one of the fastest transforming areas right now using artificial intelligence. So people are looking at legal operations. Can I manage my case rules better? Can I have my case strategy? You know, can I help follow my court documents, contract management, all these types of things, policy, legislation. But there's this company in Los Angeles called Legal Nation. It was started by three lawyers with zero technical knowledge. So they went to try to solve the same one. And they actually built an AI associate lawyer. So they built an AI system that can actually read discovery information, read court documents, generate deposition questions, respond to complaints, and actually assist with case strategy. So one of their big clients is Walmart. And Walmart gets sued all the time. And one case, a broken big company gets sued all the time. Walmart had a case where this guy bought a whole chicken, and when he bit into the gizzard, he chipped his tooth. Of course, of course. 
Well, this guy was a dentist. He should have known better, right? Yeah. But he sued Walmart for damages. <laughs> Normally, Walmart would settle out of court, right? They just don't want the hassle. Take this guy sixty, seventy thousand dollars and be done with it, right? But because Walmart is using Legal Nation's AI associate lawyer, the AI did the analysis, and part of his case strategy is suggested was it's a well-known fact that when chickens eat, they eat stones. And the stones get stored in the gizzard. And since that's a material fact, this dentist guy, when he bought the whole chicken and the gizzard, should realize he's at risk of that, and thus there's no liability for Walmart. That was the argument that won Walmart the case. Right? And we were like, wow, that's amazing. How in the world did the AI even know that? And so we went back and we could find nothing about chickens or stones or gizzards in his training. It actually pieced that together through its legal research, its knowledge, its intuition, if you will. Most lawyers would not have known that. Right? Unless they grew up on a farm, they probably would not have known that defense. That's the power of AI, especially in law. Pretty cool? Yeah. Are you guys going to look at chickens on the same color of chickens again? No. Probably not. And so we actually have a lot of issues going on when it comes to law. So the United Nations is actually actively working on robot judges. Right? It would actually improve access, the judicial system, hopefully reduce corruption in In fact, China has virtual courtrooms, and they're currently building an AI arbitrator so that the AI arbitrator can do 10,000 arbitrations at the exact same time. And of course, they're so backward. Right, we're talking about more tools for lawyers, so like if you want to be a public defender, you're managing like over 100 cases. The first time you even see your client is in court when they're about to be arraigned. So if you work with an AI, like legal assistance that can at least capture your key information and help that lawyer prepare, you use those five minutes wisely. So again, a lot of this is all about AI and human AI. There's also some big questions that we have to tackle ourselves. So this, do anybody recognize this robot, by the way? Yeah. Yes. yes. Who is that? Sophia, right? Maybe you saw her on uh, Jimmy Fallon. So one of the big questions we've been tackling at the United Nations is, do machines have rights? Right? Should they be paid? Especially if they're taking more jobs. No, right? Well, as we're trying to figure this out, Saudi Arabia trumped us. So last year, Saudi Arabia granted Sophia citizenship. That's right. A robot is now considered a person. And Sophia is considered a person in Saudi Arabia. She actually has a Saudi Arabian passport. I just find it ironic that they granted a robot citizenship when they gave women the right to drive. Right. So does this mean that Sophia is entitled to wages? Basic health care, maybe care. Someone's working on her, addressing her base, is that harassment? We're trying to figure that out. It's a big question. There's another instance where a guy created an AI that can actually create inventions. And so when, when they filed the patents, it was actually under the AI today. The U.S. Patent Office said, no dice, the machine cannot be an inventor. Whereas in other countries, like in Asia, they say, no, the machine can totally be an inventor. Who's right? Asia. So we have to figure these things out. So we got some big challenges in there. I've stayed about it before. <laughs> right? But when it comes to using AI, we have to figure out what to do. A lot of people say this is the realm of smart technologists. And it's not just smart technologists that are going to make AI happen. The way we do AI projects is different than the way we do technology projects in general. It has to be a partnership between 
business experts, domain experts, and technology people. How many smart programmers do you know understand medicine? Law. Sales. Right? So to do this right, we have to figure out how do we actually maximize the value and how do we create the right team. AI is not about all coding. In fact, there's very little coding in AI itself. It's more about the experience around it. The reality is, is do you have the data? That's the number one challenge that comes to the AI. Do you actually have the data? If you do, fantastic. It's about experimenting a little bit of coding. But this data piece, the experimenting piece, it needs a collaboration between business and IT. So you got to focus on a problem. What is the problem that I want to solve? It's not about using the technology for itself. The so legal nation, their AI associate lawyer, the problem they're looking at, there's a lot of tedious paperwork that goes in and going through the discovery for all these types of things. It's work most lawyers just don't want to do. Right? So okay, there's a problem and opportunity. The question comes is do we have the data? Can't do anything about it, that's the fuel for AI. How much data do you think you need? A lot, a lot right? AlphaGo, 10,000 hours of television search. Right? So do we have the data? If we don't have the data, should we get it from somebody else? Do we manufacture it? Right? If we don't have the data, we can't use AI. That's just the bottom line. We have the data, we get it, we can, and then we have to focus on the training. Right? Who's going to train the machine? The machine. So this AI lawyer the nation created, who trained it? Itself. What do you think? Who can train a social lawyer or something? Lawyers, yeah. Right? It's not having smart technical guys do the training. They need lawyers to train the machine. So they take eight guys away or people away from global hours to invest in this. Very well worthwhile. Right? And we'll learn more about this piece in another workshop. But these are the key things. Challenge number one, we have data. Challenge number two, we have a good training approach, good strategy. And we have to be careful of bias. Right. At the end of the day, we're all biased to some degree, whether it's explicitly or implicitly. Now, the UN wants to use AI judges, right? There is a wealth of data out there to train the AI. Plenty of people get to have train this machine. The reason we haven't done it yet is we have a challenge, and that data is biased. If you were to give all the court information, all the judgments to the machine, the machine's probably going to learn that some ethnicities get harsher sentences, and some ethnicities get lighter sentences. Right? Is that right? No. No. Right? So we have to figure out where the biases are and how we handle those situations. We don't want the AI to perpetuate our own challenges. Which is why we're focused on something called responsible AI. So using AI for ethical use, as well as AI that can explain itself. Let's watch a quick little video. What is responsible AI? Imagine you're driving down the freeway. There's a slowdown up ahead. So you slow down. But what about after it clears up? Will you stay at a slow speed just in case at some point traffic slows down again? Of course not. You'll drive fast again, knowing that if you need to use the brakes, you will. Those brakes do for your car what responsible AI does for your business. It lets companies implement AI at scale with confidence. Knowing responsible AI can help avoid problems up ahead or even course correct, all by making transparent, trustworthy decisions. Companies using AI to help identify and recruit candidates run the risk of perpetuating inherent biases in the data drawing on practices that might have skewed to one group or another in the past. But responsible AI can help them recruit and consider a broader pool of qualified candidates. We hope this was a fair representation of responsible AI. Thank you, Xavier. So 
So we have a lot of power, which comes with a lot of responsibility. So one of the examples we've talked about is recruiting. All right, you can use this to help find job applicants that have the right skills, the right cultural fit for your company. Is there any challenges there? Do you think that's just okay as is, or do we need responsible AI for that? Why do we need responsible AI? How many people have heard of an old company called Amazon? Yes. Yeah, maybe some guys, maybe some folks. So Amazon launched an AI recruiting tool, and the AI would go through the resumes, identify who would get candidates, strong candidates, jobs. Because sometimes they get a couple thousand people applying for a single job, right? So that would be more fair, we try to look at everybody. A small, small problem with what they did. Turns out the AI they trained was sexist. <laughs> How in the world did that happen? Well, they had 10 years of data from other hires and saw who were good employees, they had those resumes, they used that as training for them, right? Do you think that Amazon is 50, 50 men and women? No. no. What do you think the breakdown is? 80, 20. Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably about 75% men, 25% women. And then of these top employees, what do you think the breakdown was? 90% yeah, right? And so guess what happened when they talked to the AI? Yeah, it was skewed towards men. So men and women tend to use different words. Right? And so the AI was taught that the words that men use on resumes is superior. And the word that women would use is not as good. Right? And so whereas a man might write like, oh, I invented this, a woman might write, oh, I'm supported this. And so in the eyes of the AI, women became less than optimal candidates. So I don't think Amazon meant to be sexist. It was a big flaw in the way they trained the AI, but they did shut the system down. Right? This is why responsible AI is so important. Another, I'm probably going to another example. How many people have heard of another company called Google? How many people use Google today? No. No. So Google has an image recognition AI tool called Google Vision. Right? It, it, it's actually really good. But about a year and a half ago, it came out that Google Vision was really good at identifying you as a human being if you're white and male. <laughs> if you were uh, a woman, tough luck, and if you're not white, you're Caucasian, bad. <laughs> Is Google sexist and racist? Yes. No. Well, I don't believe they are. I really don't believe they are. Again, this is why diversity and inclusion is so important to start developing an AI solution. But again, to teach you that the machine, the concept of people, what do you think those engineers did? Visual appearance. They use pictures of themselves, most likely, right? They have to be mostly white men. And so it never dawned on them that this was a problem. The same thing, you can take an AI and teach you to recognize people, you can include, include all genders, all ethnicities, all kinds of hairstyles and stuff. But if you never showed any pictures of a person wearing glasses, guess what happens? You can't recognize a person in glasses as a person. See the challenge? All right, this is the challenge. This is why I said the two challenges you have data and then you have the training. That's why training is a good job. Yeah, I know. Uh, but this is why it's so important to think that so it's not just about how we use the technology and the great ideas we can come up, the great solutions we can build, 
It's about how we apply it. Right? So we can use it for good, we can use it for bad, we can use it for money, we can use it for social impact. A lot of things we can do here, but we're going to think differently across the board how we use artificial intelligence. Great example of this, Stopbot. Hashtag Stopbot. I'm not joking, that's the name of this thing. Ocean Health Alliance is using drones and AI to assess ocean health. And what they do is that these drones follow whale pods. And when a whale blows in snow, so to speak, right, it blows in snow hole, the drone will swoop in. And on top of the drone are some petri dishes. And so the, the stock of the mucus gets collected the petri dish. And then the AI will actually analyze what's in the petri dish. So you have water, you have crustaceans, you have kelp, you have algae, all these things that all different areas, but we aggregate them together, you can actually get a picture of the local health of that ocean for this whole area. We couldn't do that as people. We don't actually have those capabilities. So if ocean health wants to do something like that, they would have to get a boat, staff it with 12 to 14 people, go out for about a week, collect all kinds of samples, build the analysis, aggregate it together to get the same thing that's not thought can do in a couple of hours. Very cool? Yes. I mean, if you guys get to go Google stuff on it. But there's no way you have to use a little thing, right? But this is a great example of thinking differently. Using the technology to create create positive social impact. Along with those things, we have to understand that machines think differently than we do. Right? Self-driving cars. How do most people drive? On their phones. On their phones. <laughs> right? We rely on our eyes, right? They're very visual, right? Watch your parents. The first self-driving vehicles relied on camera information. And then one day there was a Tesla on autopilot because the driver was watching Harry Potter. So no. oh. Watching Harry Potter. And there was a truck that wiped out the highway about 300 yards ahead. And the truck bed was blocking the highway, the road. The Tesla never stopped. The driver, busy watching Harry Potter, never noticed. And so the driver would drive through and truck and the top of the car got ripped off. People were like, how on earth did, did that happen? Well, it was a cloudy day and the truck bed was white. So it blended into the background. So the cameras couldn't distinguish an object there. Oops. We've now realized that if machines think differently, machines can use radar or LIDAR. If the Tesla has been using that, that never would happen to stop from the time. They also use auditory sensors. We know that we can hear the little kid about to run across the tree, but we see the little kid. They're using IoT sensor data in the car, in the roads, in the lights, in landmarks, and other cars to know exactly where everything is. So before it even makes that left turn, it actually knows what's going down on that left turn path. That is why self-driving cars are actually better than us at driving. They can process all these data points, thousands of data points in microseconds, in real time, constantly. Right? We have a problem just getting our eyes away from our phone all the time. Food. How many of you guys are foodies? All right. Do you think that AI could be a great chef? Yes. Yes. You mean they have to create great recipes? Yes. How is it going to do that? How do, you, how do you know food is going to be good? It tastes it, right? Machines don't have taste buds. How does it know if it creates a ripple recipe? Chemical composition. That's not efficient. You can have the machine called the recipe. We make it and we try it. That's not efficient. How 
way that we have an AI that's come up with competing combinations, we have the thought over 50,000 years of living history. How can it come up with the chocolate Austrian burrito or the Vietnamese apple kebab? Both delicious, by the way. Knowing the chemical components of uh, flavor sensors and what chemicals they react with, and uh, supposing how they bond or interacting with each other, and you train them until it does that problem. Awesome, that's exactly right. You can teach the machine chemistry. You can teach it the chemical combinations that produce nutrients, flavors, aromas, even appearance. So it doesn't actually have to guess that it's going to be good or that it's healthy. It knows it. They have a level. How many of you guys can teach via chemistry? How many of you guys right? How many of you can cook via chemistry? No, but these, that's the power the machine has, the capability that we can invent, to leverage. So this is not just about us pushing we teach the machines how we do things, but to figure out the best way for a machine to do something. Because again, we do some things much better than machines. Right? Machines can't imagine. They don't have creativity. Right? They're not, they're not going to pass us in that area. But there are some things like driving and cooking where they bring new capabilities to bear that augment our own. So this is the unique opportunity that we have with artificial intelligence. Right? This is not just, oh my god, it's a lot of math, computer science, it's another class, it's boring stuff. This isn't even the future. So all the stuff I showed you is happening already, or has been happening for a while. AI is very much the present. We just haven't really tapped the potential yet. Jobs of tomorrow? AI. AI is sparking the fourth industrial revolution. Anyone heard of the industrial revolution? Yes. Yeah. yeah. This is sparking the fourth one. Our world is going to be radically different in 10 years. That's why it's so important to have a basic knowledge of what this is, right? Because no matter what you do in life, you're going to be touching an AI or using an AI or creating an AI as you love it. With that, I save a little bit of time. This is just an intro. We'll probably dive into more concepts later. But I want to see if you guys have any questions. Yeah? So what do you do with your job? That's my job, is to make sure that people are trying to do the right thing. So my work with the United Nations, for example, revolved around the sustainable development goals. Anyone ever heard of those? Yeah. So if you're not familiar, the UN is defining 17 goals for a better world. So zero poverty, zero hunger, protect life on land on sea, improve gender equality, reduce income equality, other cities, I won't bore you with all 17, but the goal is to make these things a reality by 2035. And unfortunately, we have a bit of a shortfall. They were from seven to 20 trillion dollars a year in achieving that. So my goal is to help the UN figure out how to use technology like AI to get that. Um, are there artificial So it's actually legal to some extent. So you can actually have self-driving cars on the freeway in California. So Singapore has actually had self-driving buses and taxis for about two years now. China has a partnership with Audi. So China has the most complex set of uh, traffic laws. And they're about to reach level four automation at the end of this year. There's five levels. When they reach level four, China's going to legalize self-driving cars. So right now, are there like self drivers in the US who are like 100% safe? Yeah, there are. The law still requires a human behind the, the driver's wheel. But next year, the California legislature is actually planning to pass a bill saying that at least on freeways, you don't want to need that human being behind the wheel. And before, I should just mention, in 2021, the use of the car. No steering wheel, no brakes, no accelerator. That's right. How many of you guys are really planning to learn how to drive? I find that really surprising. 
Why is it that the United States is so far behind other countries in terms of AI research? Part, part of it is just commitment and part of it is just the will to spend big investment in people around you. Right, we're talking about huge amounts of people time and cash. And, uh, you know, people love working for Google's first reaction to everything this money, to raise taxes. So our minimum levels are the strongest in the other countries out there. So part of the problem with like AI is that we require a large amount of data, but why would we as a consumer give the company the data so that they, they can train like the AI? So. so your question is, is why would consumers give the data to these companies to train AI? Well, we actually give the data to them without realizing it. Usually. That's how many of you guys use Instagram? Yeah. 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 They sell your data. They sell your data. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Instagram is owned by Facebook. Facebook is not a social media company. It's a data company. Google. How many guys use Google? Jesus. Why would I? And how much do you pay to use Google? Nothing. So how much does Google make money? Uh, selling. Selling your data. Right? Yeah. You guys use email? No. Yes.
Any other questions? There's no more questions. We have to give you a test. All right, there's no more questions. Give Mr. Saluda a big round of applause.